Well, this is our last service for today, and I wanted to take a minute to thank all of the hospitality people and the bus drivers and the people that have been here all morning helping, and Joy and Beth and the choir and the orchestra. I really appreciate you guys giving your entire morning snowy morning. You could have made a snowman, but instead you spent so, so thank you. And I don't have permission from my wife to do this, but Sherry Swanson said it would be okay. Uh, I want to introduce um, my dear wife, my best friend, the most beautiful woman in the world, sitting next to our son Scott in from Vero Beach, Florida. Welcome. Let's welcome her. And let's stand for our scripture reading from John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord from the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb, both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Simon Peter came along, went straight into the tomb, and saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was him. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus calls her name, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all the things that he had said to her. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. Every year at Easter time, pastors scratch their heads and ask themselves what can be said on Easter Sunday. After all, the story is the same year after year, and it turns out the same year after year. I've thought of many sermons that I have uh, shared in the past, sermons about proof of the resurrection, why I believe sermons about Christ being victorious over death. And I am fine with all of that, and those will certainly be on the table uh, some other day. But the thing that I was thinking as I was preparing for Easter Sunday, I kept hearing this voice saying, so what? So what? I think there are a lot of people in our world, even a lot of Christians, that are saying, so what? They know the story. We read the story. They know the story, but their life isn't different. It's as if our Christianity is locked uh, between 11.15 and 12.05. We give Jesus an hour on Sunday morning, and then the rest of the week is ours. We know the story of the resurrection, but as far as how we live, we're just still keeping Jesus in the tomb. So the question really isn't, did he rise? I believe he rose. The question is, will you let him rise in your life? 
Will you appropriate the message of his death and resurrection into your daily life and let it change you? There are many ways that we keep Jesus in the tomb. I believe in love, but I don't give it to others. I believe in generosity, but I spend most of it on myself. I believe in going the second mile, but I don't make myself do it. I believe in forgiveness, but do not forgive. If this is how we're living, our Jesus is in the tomb. I believe God calls people, but I don't take much time to listen. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, but I don't turn it loose in my life. If any of these sounds, if these things sound like your story, then uh, your Jesus might still be in the tomb. A lot of people don't believe today. All over the country, all over the world, there are many people who do not believe the message. They do not hear the story. And I want to suggest to you that one of the reasons they don't believe is because of the way that some Christians do and don't live out their Christianity. People do not believe our message because Christians can be arrogant. Nothing more inviting Nothing more inviting than an arrogant Christian inviting you to believe in Jesus. We have to allow people to have their questions. We cannot be threatened by people that have questions. People that say, well, I'm an atheist. Don't be worried about that. Just let God work with them in his time. Everybody has a different spiritual journey, and we need to give people space to find their way. Anytime we are arrogant and insist people think or do it just the way we did, it ends up driving away the very people that we hope to win. People don't believe our message because Christians don't love. We're supposed to be the people of love, but too often this is what Christians are doing. Christians are notorious for pointing the finger at you, at you, at you, at this group, at that group. What's wrong with these folks? What's wrong with those folks? And I want to say to you, if you are a Christ follower, there's only one way that you're supposed to be pointing, and that way is up toward God, toward the joy that we found in him. Anytime we are pointing at other people, we are off mission, we're missing the point People don't believe in the God that we proclaim because instead of pointing to him, we're doing something else. People don't believe our message because when they get to know us, they find that our hearts are just as filled with unforgiveness and guilt and brokenness as anyone else. We don't always live as if our Jesus has risen from the grave. Easter Sunday. It's snowing on Easter Sunday. I mean, when does that happen? Maybe today would be a good time for us to get the message, for us to really get it right, for us to walk out the door and say, my life's going to be different from here on out. There is an alternative to a powerless, guilt-laden life. Jesus talked about the abundant life. That's not about buying a new car this year. It's not about more in your savings account. It's not about making sure you get into a good neighborhood. It's not about getting what you want. The abundant life is the life where we know from the top of our head to the soles of our feet that we are forgiven and free. The abundant life begins when we finally get it down in the core of who we are that God loves us. If you grew up in church, you're familiar with the scripture, God so loved the world that he It's a great message, but I'd just like to take the first five words. God so loved the world. That sets everything else up. God looked at you and said you were worth it. God looked at you and said, I will sacrifice my son for you. God so loved the world. And yet the world is full of Christians that can't forgive themselves. The churches are full of, 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 of people who believe that, that God forgives and God forgives people, but they can't quite figure it out that God forgives me. I've struggled with this feeling from time to time. Like I believe God forgives the choir and all of you and everybody else that was here this morning, but not me. 
You know, when you think about that, if, if you think like that, it kind of feels like we're being humble, like we're saying, oh, God, I'm so sorry, I'm so bad, I don't feel like you can forgive me because I'm worse than all those other people. It feels sort of humble. But I want to suggest to you today something kind of painful is it's not humble at all, it's really very arrogant. For me to think that God can forgive all of you but not me, it's like me saying, I have the biggest sins, I have the worst history, I'm the baddest of them all. Your forgiveness is effective for everyone else, but you're going to have to do something bigger, something better uh, for me to find forgiveness. As if we want uh, an additional crucifixion, a special suffering and death of Jesus on the cross and a special resurrection just for us. One for everybody else that happened a long time ago. One for us that just happened so I can finally know that my sins are forgiven. Is that really how we want to come across to God? I want to suggest to you today that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his suffering and death, was one time, once and for all. That includes everyone else, and that includes you. And the moment that you know that the Easter message can be real in your life, everything changes. Because we stop seeing ourselves as this broken, wrecked, lousy human being and begin to see ourselves for the person that God says that we are. Over and over in Scripture, we are reminded of this theme. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. So I want to tell you my, my story. The poor choir, they've heard this story four times today. They didn't like it the first time. It's not a very good story. Um, it's the story of the sheeply lion, and I know sheeply isn't a word, but it's just a story, so go with me. And as the story goes, a lion cub is randomly in the me meadow, and um, a mama sheep and her flock of sheep come across the uh, uh, lion cub, and instead of being afraid, they're good Methodists, they decide to adopt the lion cub and take him in. Uh, so they teach him what it means to live, what it means to be a sheep. He, he lives what he learns. He learns what he lives. Uh, he, he walks with little sticks, kind of short little steps, and he eats grass, and he says, bah, bah, bah. It's a great story. And, uh, and so life goes on, you know. He's, he's just going along. He's being a sheep. And, and one day at the edge of the meadow, the, the uh, forest lion comes out of the trees, and he looks out upon the flock of sheep, and he says, Mm, lunchtime. And he begins to charge into the flock, and the sheep are scattered. They go every different direction, and the sheeply lion takes off running, 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 running. And the forest lion goes, is that a lion with the sheep running? And he gets interested. He begins to chase, running, running, the forest lion, chasing the sheeply lion, and running, running, and finally the forest lion, uh, because he has more protein, he's faster, you know, and he, he catches the sheeply lion. He sweeps his legs, and this Sheeply lion rolls up into a ball and he's stuck against the trees. Don't eat me, don't eat me, don't eat me. The forest lion's going, what is the world coming to? What, what is the world? What is wrong with you? What are you doing? You don't eat me, don't, please don't eat me, Mr. Lion. Finally, the uh, forest lion has had enough. He grabs the sheeply lion by the mane. He drags him over to the pond he sticks his face down, and for the first time in his life, the sheeply lion sees a reflection of who he really is. And as the story goes, he looks up in the face of the forest lion, back down at his own reflection in the water, stands up, gives a great roar. <laughs> I said all those nice things about you guys. <laughs> you just made the service last longer. <laughs> and
And he was never a sheep again. <laughs> Some of you don't know who you are. Some of you have not yet realized who you are in Christ. Some of you have heard this message over and over again, but you've yet to let it sink down to the core of your being. This Easter Sunday, I'm asking you to look in the reflective waters of God's love and see who you are. In Christ, you are forgiven, you are free, and you are loved. And that makes all the difference in the world. Because we are forgiven, our lives no longer have to be about how broken and unhappy we are, how guilty we feel. We can sense God's love every day and we can give it to others because we are forgiven. We can offer forgiveness to others. That is the message of the cross and the resurrection, that we can be forgiven and we can live lives as forgiving people. If you're a Christian, it's not enough just to believe in forgiveness. We need to practice it. We need to get really, really good at it. Forgiveness means deciding that I'm not going to make that person pay for what they did. It means that whatever feeling I have about getting back at them, lashing out, I'm not going to do it. In forgiveness, you absorb the debt. You take the cost completely upon yourself. You absorb the pain. Instead of passing it on or hurting back, you follow the example of Jesus who said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When you understand that you are forgiven and loved, when you wake up in the morning and recognize that God loves you that much, our hearts begin to get filled with the ability to forgive others. This is a great power that God has put in the world. By taking on the pain, the hurt of a situation, by absorbing it instead of giving it back to others, we transform moments that would have been continuous fighting and hatred into moments of grace and love. Life is stormy. Relationships can be stormy. You have a chance to bring calm to the storm. You, because you understand who you are, you've looked in the water, you see who you are in Christ. You can lead your family to forgive that cousin. You can forgive your neighbor, your child, your parent. God's love can actually fill you so much that you can't help but some of it pour out to those who've hurt you in the past. In the cross and resurrection, Jesus puts an end to the brokenness and the hostility and creates for us a new life and a new hope. God so loved the world. It's more than a phrase we learned long, long ago. It's a phrase that should wake us up every morning to a life that's excited to be alive in this world, to a life that can't, where we can't wait who we'll run into just so we can care about them. In Christ, we are victorious. Yeah, we struggle from time to time. And from time to time, we need to remember who we are. That's why we get together on Sunday morning, to remember that God has done this absolutely amazing thing. And Jesus is not to be left in the tomb, but is to be released, to be free in our hearts and lives. If you've been to a memorial service with a graveside and after the graveside it's a military honors and they fold the flag and they have a 21-gun salute and then they play taps and it's over. 
day is done, gone the sun, it's over, it's kind of final, it's done. Winston Churchill planned his own funeral, picked the songs, picked the speakers, uh, and when it was all done, he had the bugler play taps. <coughs> but he refused to leave it there, because when taps was done, the bugler paused for a moment, and then started Winston Churchill's final request, which was reveille. Wake up, get up, go. Death is not the final word. Pain, destruction, sin is not the final word. In Christ, we are invited to awake to the miraculous message that Jesus is alive, that we are forgiven, that we are loved by God. Friends, this Christianity isn't just about eternity while it is, but we are invited and gifted with the power of forgiveness to learn to live a life filled with love, with hope, 